And we are live. All right, hello and welcome to another Wednesday workshop presented to you by New View Trust Company. My name is Tom Tantillo. I'm an IRS specialist here at New View. I am subbing in for Nate Hare and uh, Brian Martinez, our usual hosts. They are doing a presentation down in uh, Dade County at DRIA. Uh, but I'm happy to sub in for them, and uh, we have a great workshop for you today talking about note investing and what to do, what not to do. We have a great speaker, Nathan Turner. He was lucky enough to be one of the sponsors of our New View annual investor retreat in the beginning of the month, and uh, we just wanted to bring him in so we can kind of go into a little bit more detail about what it is that he does and he, he brings in a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience when it comes to no investing uh, but before we bring him in just wanted to talk a little bit about new view what it is uh, that we are and what we do for the people who haven't joined us yet for one of our wednesday workshops uh, but the best place to start is talking about what is a self-directed IRA. Now, it's important that a self-directed IRA isn't exactly a type of IRA. It's mainly a marketing term, but uh, we differ from your traditional custodians like your Fidelities, your Charles Schwab's, your Vanguard's, where they take your IRAs or your retirement accounts, your retirement funds, throw them in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and they just make their commissions. Where at New View, you're fully self-directing your retirement. You're the entrepreneur. You're finding your own investments and choosing your own investments. And it's mainly alternative assets. So things like real estate, uh, mortgages, notes, private equity, cryptocurrency, pretty much everything. The IRS doesn't necessarily restrict you from investing in uh, any asset class besides two things. And uh, those two asset classes are life insurance contracts and collectibles. So uh, pretty much anything outside of that is fair game. And uh, of course, we're talking about self-directed IRAs and it's important to talk about the benefits. And yeah, like going back to the Fidelity and the Vanguards of the world, they'll tell you that they're diverse in their assets. Like, oh, here's like a high risk mutual fund. Here's a low risk mutual fund but you're still diverse in only one asset class and that's publicly traded equities. Uh, there's other assets and other, uh, other assets to invest in, like things like real estate, tangible assets, something that you can drive by and actually see, not just the made up stock certificate and investing in numbers and watching them go up and down every single second. Uh, there's a lot of value to that. And if you want a truly diverse portfolio, it's important to get off the stock market or what I like to say, get off of Wall Street and on the main street a little bit, dive into the sector of alternative assets. And most importantly, do it with your IRA because of the amount of tremendous tax savings that you can get in a tax deferred or tax free environment. And how I kind of like to paint the picture of like how powerful it can be to use an IRA is that let's say you had $1, right? And let's say this $1 was in a Roth IRA. And then let's say why $1 was just your own personal use and let's say you're an amazing investor, you double this $1 every single year for 20 years. If you do it in your own personal funds and you're paying uh, capital gains tax every year, and let's just say it's a generous rate of 25%, probably gonna be higher than that and tax rates may go up in the future. If you double that $1 every single year after 20 years, you're left with roughly $72,000. But if you do that in a Roth IRA where you're paying no capital gains taxes, you turn that $1 into over a million dollars in 20 years. So that's kind of truly how powerful it can be to use your IRA to invest and on a tax-free environment. And what we always like to tell people here at New View is that invest in what you know best. If you're a real estate investor, if that's what you do for a living, there's no reason as to why not you shouldn't be doing it within your IRA, within your retirement account, because that's the asset class that you know best. And if you don't know about real estate or no investing, then that's why you're tuning in to one of our Wednesday workshops here at New View. So you can learn a little bit more and be a little bit more comfortable with uh, diving into the alternative asset world. Um, and just to go over the types of plans that we have here at New View, there's seven. We have your personal plans, which is your Roth IRA uh, and traditional IRA. The Roth IRA goes tax-free. You do not get the tax deduction on the way in. Uh, but with the traditional IRA, you do get the tax deduction on the way in, but it grows tax deferred. 
Wow, we have three different employer plans, the solo 401k. If you're interested in learning more about that, make sure you visit our landing page, soloqrp.com. And QRP just stands for Qualified uh, Retirement Plan. That's just a marketing term that we use. And uh, also SEP and Simple IRAs. And uh, HSAs and ESAs, those are great accounts uh, that aren't necessarily retirement accounts. There are ways to invest in a tax advantage way for health expenses and education expenses, which most of us on the planet here, we incur health expenses all the time and education expenses. So uh, if you have those expenses, there's no reason as to why you shouldn't have uh, those accounts open. And if you're interested in learning more, uh, make sure you contact us here at Nuvi to learn more about those plans and uh, if you qualify and how they work. And uh, just to go over some of the asset classes that a lot of our Nuvi clients do invest in, like real estate, there's foreclosures, apartments, pretty much everything you see on the screen here, promissory notes, private entities, and uh, even cryptocurrencies, uh, which have become a lot more popular over these past couple of years, considering the tremendous amount of growth and attention that uh, that asset sector has really gotten. And uh, again, you're the entrepreneur here at New View. We do not give you any kind of investment advice and we're not selling you any investments. We're doing these workshops just so you can learn a little bit about certain asset classes. So in this case, we're learning about promissory notes and uh, we'll be diving a little bit into that, but make sure you're tuning in every week to learn a little bit more about all these different types of assets that you can invest in. And that pretty much sums up New View. So like I said, our speaker today is Nathan Turner. He is with Earnest Investing, and he's also known as the Canadian Note Guy. I believe he's streaming uh, with us all the way from Canada today, actually. And uh, we're very happy to have him in. Like I said, he was one of our sponsors at our investor retreat. Uh, very knowledgeable when it comes to no investing, plenty of years of experience. And he's speaking at conferences all across like the world about no investing. I know I was talking to him about paper source convention going on in Las Vegas in the spring. We'll most likely see him there. But Nathan, I'll let you take the floor, get started with everything. And uh, we'll do questions at the end. All right. You bet. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. This is uh, this is great. I, I'm up in Great White North. It's minus 20 degrees Celsius. That puts it at minus four degrees Fahrenheit. But I get to come and talk to everybody in the comfort of my office, and and it's just nice. I get to look out at the snow and not have to get out into it. So it's it's all right. So I wanted to talk to everybody about uh, note investing today. So really quickly, I'm, I am the Canadian note guy. Um, what you need to know though is uh, if you're not Canadian, that's okay. Uh, all of the business that I do is in the U.S. I haven't done any business in Canada for over 10 years, actually. Uh, everything that I do is in the U.S., and so, so that has really no bearing on uh, what you can and cannot do uh, or what I can, can and cannot do, but uh, it just, I just I like more taxes, I guess, so I'm here. So I want to talk to you a little bit about today uh, the seven habits of highly effective note investors. For the Stephen Covey fans out there, I apologize if I completely butcher um, Mr. Covey's <laughs> book. Uh, I'm just taking the, the ideas and the concepts. I'm not really going to get into a deep dive of the book, uh, but I will say this is, this is that book. If you haven't seen it before, if you haven't read it, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It is uh, absolutely a game changer. Uh, one of those books that will, will impact your life forever going forward. I first read this in university 20 years ago. Um, and it was part of a uh, entrepreneurship class, actually, which I thought was kind of uh, apropos once I read it. I had no intention of going into business for myself. I had no intention of becoming an entrepreneur, uh, but this did help shift my thinking. And that's actually the very first thing that, that Mr. Covey talks about is uh, he talks about there being a paradigm shift and how you need to kind of change your brain uh, to think about different things than you thought of before. And so as I was thinking about this and, and different examples, uh, this is what I came up with. So I, I love snowboarding. I've been snowboarding since I was 17. Um, and the very first time I went, my brother and I went up, we went to go take a lesson at a hill that wasn't too far away. And uh, I grew up in Western Canada, uh, it, just outside the Rockies. So we went up to a beautiful hill. In the lesson, there was our teacher, there was my brother and I, and then there were two other guys from Australia. And they had surfed in Australia. They grew up surfing. 
uh, they knew surfing very well. So they figured they would have no problem picking up snowboarding. It's the same thing, sliding, you know, balance the same, everything's the same. You just, you're on snow and still water. Uh, so maybe. <laughs> what we came to find out later on that day, uh, I ran into him again and I said, so, you know, how does this compare to surfing? And they said, well, actually, it's really interesting because with surfing, uh, the balance is very similar. And there are a lot of things that are very similar. However, the biggest difference with snowboarding and surfing is with surfing, you steer with your front foot. And in snowboarding, you steer with your back foot. Uh, so a very different thing. And you kind of kind of wrap your mind around that and, and come to terms with it so that you can go forward. So um, I've been snowboarding, like I say, a long time. This is me back in my heyday uh, when, when I was really good. I, I'm, I, I, can still, I can still shred, but I don't know if I can hit the jumps quite as big as I used to. Um, we'll see. We'll see. I'm teaching my kids and, uh, and this whole idea of the paradigm shift has become something really important uh, to kind of talk to them about how it works and, and how to shift your weight and things like that. And it's different. They, they grew up skiing and it's about shifting your weight differently and, and holding yourself differently in a different kind of balance. So just wrapping your head around this paradigm shift. What I'm trying to say is this is not real estate. Uh, it's real estate related, but it is not real estate. So you, you cannot approach it the same way. There are a lot of similarities and there are, it's an asset class within notes, but it's not the same thing. So you, you've got to kind of get your head around that. So that's, that's the very first thing you just kind of get, you got to kind of come to terms with before you get into notes uh, as an asset class. Uh, which brings us to the very first habit that, uh, that is introduced in the book, and that is be proactive. So I'm, what I took from this, and again, I'm, I'm doing my own spin on the book, but when we're talking about being proactive, it's what is it that you want to do? Um, this was a story. So I started note investing in 2010 and it was in 2015. Uh, I'd kind of come to a bit of a crossroads and I wasn't exactly sure which direction I wanted to go and how to do it. And I was kind of feeling stuck. And it was a conversation with a friend of mine where he said, so what is it you want to do? And I, I hadn't thought about that uh, particular question for way, way, way too long. So it was when he asked that question and then I took a step back and really decided what, it, how I wanted to do this business and which way to approach it. Uh, at that point, I became the Canadian note guy and uh, started kind of branding myself that way. And that was, that was wonderful. And it's been a, a really good, fun uh, way to kind of get myself out there. And that was my, my old logo. Um, for people getting started, when you're talking about being proactive, you have got to get some kind of education. Um, like I say, this is not real estate and you cannot approach it the same way. So you've got to get some ed education. I don't sell education. I don't do education. I can refer you to some really good friends of mine that do uh, some really good education, uh, but you do need to get some kind of education on that. So just that's the first thing I would say with being proactive is, is get to know what it is that you're doing uh, before you get started in it. Another thing that I would say is get to know other people in the space. Uh, who are the sellers? Who are the other vendors? Whatever, you know, realtors, uh, lawyers, uh, property managers, and all kinds of different uh, vendors that are included in here. Your IRA custodians, make sure you know, you know, what you can and cannot do within your IRA and how that works. And then get to know other investors. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating space where uh, as much as we're, a lot of us are doing a very similar thing, it, I don't know anybody that does exactly the same thing or approaches notes exactly the same way. And, and we may get into some of that uh, here today of different ways that you can approach it. There are so many different avenues that you can take with notes uh, that, that the people that are doing it are not really in direct competition with each other. So it makes it a really friendly and fun and uh, really, you know, tight space where we, we all know each other and we, we have fun together and we chat together and we share stories and, and tips and ideas and it's it's really open so get to know other node investors and you can learn a, a lot uh, just from free conversation uh, just to give you an example of this when when i first started uh, i was coming from a real estate background so uh, i would my whole intent was all about getting to the property so i always wanted to get to the property get to the property get to the property which is great um, and that is one approach 
And as I continued on, I decided, you know what? I don't actually want the property as much as I can, as much as I can swing it. I don't actually ever want to own the property if I can help it. I would much rather uh, buy the loan and keep it performing and just dealing with the paper itself. So, so we've got, done a bit of a shift in the last, uh, oh gosh, few months where we've, uh, we've opened up earnest investing and it's our, it's our fund that we're, uh, we're managing, doing really a lot of this, almost the same thing that we we're doing before with a little bit of different focus, but, but uh, shifted from that going after the property to going after paper uh, as I've continued on this journey. So the next habit that uh, is introduced in the book is to begin with the end in mind. Uh, and this is a really important one just to kind of get an idea of where you want to go. So specifically, we can talk about exit strategies. So I'll introduce this chart to here. Uh, we'll go over a little bit more detail in a further slide, but just to give you an idea, and this is not comprehensive, but it gives you some, a bit of a visual of different ways that you can go with notes, all those different little green bubbles there, those are all different exit strategies. And which one is your preferred? Uh, do you have a preferred or is any one of those okay? How would you like to approach this? But, but taking an idea to think about what it is that you want. When we're getting into notes, you're talking about things like lean position. Do you want to attack just first lean position? Do you want second lean position? Um, no, there are third and fourth leans. If you want to get into that, uh, that's somebody else is going to have to teach you about that. Uh, but there's a lean position uh, component to that you're going to have to decide on. What about areas? Do you only want to buy notes uh, within driving distance, within your state, your county? Um, for myself, I decided that I just have a really big backyard. Uh, so I invest all over the US and we've been in, in, in as many as 30 different states. Uh, currently, I don't think we're quite that much, but, but uh, all over the place. What kind of size of note do you want? Are you looking for multi-million dollar? Are you looking for commercial? Or are you looking for uh, you know, a, a Columbus, Ohio note where the note's gonna be $50,000? Like what, what is it? What size of note and what's what kind of uh, property value, what kind of property class do you have behind that? Well, that's another thing to think about before you even get started. Really, are you going to be a buy and hold uh, kind of a, an investor, or are you just trying to flip things out? Are you going to buy a note and hang on to it for the long term income, or do you just want to rehab it and sell it back out? And then business organization: Are you doing this on your own? Are you going to join up with somebody on a JV partnership? Or are you going to invest into a fund like mine and, and let somebody else do all the heavy lifting and just collect checks, uh, but decide on what kind of organization you want. So to give you an idea, this is, this is my preference and it's not right or wrong, but this is just my preference. And like I say, there are a lot of different people in the space and they're all doing it different ways. This is what I do. I like property values between 50,000 and 150,000. I won't go into the reasons for all of these, but that's what I like. I like fast foreclosure states. To me, fast foreclosure is anything less than nine months. Uh, so, so New England is pretty much all out. Uh, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, foreclosure timelines tend to be much longer than that. So I, I tend not to buy in those states. I concentrate on, on faster foreclosure. I love Texas. Uh, Florida has actually turned around years ago. It was well over 18 months. Uh, we just completed foreclosure in eight months, just uh, couple of weeks ago. So it, it's come a long way. Uh, first lien and, and contracts for deed, CFD. A contract for deed is a very similar, it's kind of a hybrid between a mortgage and a, a rental. So kind of like a rent to own, similar to that idea. That's what I buy. I don't have any preference for vacancy. If the property is vacant, that's fine with me. Uh, I don't have any preference on equity. If there's a lot of equity, if there's zero equity, if it's negative equity, that's totally fine. I don't, I don't have a preference that way. Um, and I, I prefer to keep the notes and keep them as performing and any kind of non-performers, the NPLs, non-performing loan, I'll buy that and rehab it so that it becomes performing and I'll hang on to the re-performer. And then I've uh, switched over to a fund organization. I was doing a JV partnerships before, which was great. Uh, but this is now a better fit for me. And uh, going forward, we're going with the fund structure. 
So just to give you an idea, that's, that's a, just a brief overview, a kind of an outline of things that you need to consider and decide before you even get started, really. So the next thing is putting first things first. Um, in notes, we're talking about due diligence and making sure you know how to do due diligence and what you're looking for for due diligence. And uh, a big, big part of that, because I'm looking at first lien mortgages, I'm looking at value and title. Those are really the two big, big things. There are plenty of other things as well, uh, but those are the, kind of the really the big two things that I'm looking at. So I'm looking at things like BPOs uh, and, and all BPOs are not created equal, uh, but it is a tool that I use to be able to um, ascertain the value of a property without having to go and visit it myself. And then I'm also looking at title uh, and I'm, I'm pulling a title report uh, before I purchase anything so that I know what's going on with taxes and uh, any other liens that may be attached. Uh, in this one, if you can see it there, there's, uh, there's one listed called US of A, uh, US of America, other liens, and it's $164,000. Uh, this is an example of one that I did not purchase. Uh, when I saw that, I, I had to call a pro title and say, what is that? I've never seen it. I have never seen it since either, uh, but it was a Department of Justice lien that it attached. Uh, it's not something I wanted to get involved with at all. Uh, it may or may not apply to me as the new note holder. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> we're done. So moved on from that one. But just as an example, you definitely want to check that out. So uh, really briefly, when I get a list, we call it a tape, and it's a, really a spreadsheet. So I'll get a spreadsheet with anywhere from 10 to 200 loans on that sheet. So I need to be able to narrow it down. So I look at things like states. Like I say, I prefer not to get into any kind of New England states because they, they take too long. So I, I take those out of my list. Uh, I'm looking at things like value and taxes. Um, some of that is on the spreadsheet, some of it is not. I'm not talking about his estimate, I'm talking about actually looking at each individual loan and the address and figuring it out to the best of my ability online what I think the value is before I go ahead and order a BPO. And that gives me an even better idea. On top of that, then I will call the realtor that did the BPO and say, so this is the value you gave me. Um, what else can you tell me about the neighborhood? Are there any other factors that I should be aware of? especially if it's a place that I haven't, uh, haven't purchased a loan previously. And then, like I mentioned, that O and E's, the, it's a current owner search. Um, owner and encumbrance is O and E. And uh, that's my title search where I'm looking for taxes, uh, other liens. Uh, even if there's junior liens to me, I just want to be aware of them so that I know uh, what's happening with it if I need to go with a foreclosure or if I can talk to the second lien holder and arrange something separately. Um, and you do not want to skip a step and uh, ask me how I know. Uh, but that's, that it's very important to make sure you hit every one of those steps before you purchase even one loan. It's, it really is essential. So the next habit uh, that uh, Mr. Covey talks about is thinking win-win. And we're talking about mutual benefits. So if you're, if you're familiar with the book, he's got a chart in there where it's got its four quadrants. It's high consideration, high courage, low consideration, low courage, and it can, you can be in any one of those four quadrants. So what we're looking for ideally is to be in the high consideration and high courage quadrant because that is really uh, going to be the best for both parties. <clears throat> we're talking about uh, doing that with your borrower, the person living in the house, we're talking about doing that with the seller, the person you're buying the loan from, we're talking about doing that with your investor or the person that you've given money to, making sure that you're both on the same page and you know you know what both of you are talking about. And then, of course, we're looking at uh, my first purchase. So quick story. So like I say, I was looking for the property initially. So I went in to, it was in Columbus, Ohio, and I had bought a package of three loans back then in 2010. And uh, two of the owners were still local. So I took a friend of mine, we went over to the other address. They did not live in these houses. And the one that I will never forget is uh, this young lady and I went and knocked on her door and said, so I'm here. I, I own the loan on your property. I'm not here to collect any money. All I actually want is the property. If you're willing to sign it over to me, I will make this debt disappear forever. And I, I hadn't actually considered that that was a win for her. And that was kind of a really eye-opening experience for me. 
uh, she was so grateful and broke down in tears and said, you know, you're not joking, you're really, really, and, and uh, was willing and able to sign the property over to me in exchange for getting rid of this huge headache that she's been carrying around, this, this burden and, you know, nightmare that she's been losing sleep over. And, uh, and here I am saying, it can all go away. I just want the property. She's been done with this property for years and just wanted to get rid of it. So it was really a win-win situation. And, and that, again, opened my eyes to that idea of, of really coming up with a, a solution that's going to benefit both parties to the best uh, ability. Uh, going on to the next point is seeking to first to understand and then to be understood. We're talking about look, having two different points of view, but you're looking at the same thing. So here's the example of this. And, and if you've seen this picture before, then you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, think about what is the first thing that you see? What is this pic a picture of? And some people will say, well, it's of an old lady. And here's her mouth, and here's her, her nose, and here's her eyes, and here's kind of her shawl. And she, you know, it kind of goes out over her head. And yes, you're right, there is an old lady. And then you look at it again, and, or you ask somebody else and say, no, 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 there's, it's a young lady. And she's, she's looking out over her shoulder, so you can see her nose kind of sticking out there with the eyelash just above it. And that other thing that looked like an eye on the old lady, that's actually her ear, and that's her jawline, and that's her necklace, and she's looking back over her shoulder. And yes, that's correct as well. And it's really a lesson in you're both looking at the same thing, uh, and you're seeing different things, but it's the same thing. So we want to get to a point where we can look at um, the same thing and see it from both perspectives. So this is something I really, really uh, endeavor to do when I'm talking with borrowers, especially, and making sure I understand. Uh, I think I'm, I think I'm pretty good at that. Where I talk to them and and I have no judgment. Uh, I know you know things happen and life is difficult from time to time and things happen and and you get into trouble. So it, I'm trying really to understand where they're coming from. And then at the same time, I want them to understand where I'm coming from. A line that I borrowed from uh, Bill Bartlett. Uh, he was a, a guy that would buy uh, unsecured debt. And I read his book years ago. And the, my one big, big takeaway from his book was this line, the only thing we can't do is nothing. And I thought that is so profound. So I will listen to the story, I will listen to everything that's been going on, and I can feel real empathy. At the same time, the only thing we can't do is nothing. I, I cannot can, you know, let you live there for nothing. So what's going to change? Are you going to start making payments? Are you, is it better for you to move out? Is it better for us to come up with a different uh, payment arrangement and kind of figure out together what it is that we can do? But really making sure that you understand both sides of that. Of that equation uh, so that you can come up with that win-win solution. I uh, would do this with investor expectations and again making sure we understand each other's point of view and where we're coming from and, and there's some open and uh, honest dialogue there where we understand where each other is coming from and what we're, what we're expecting. So another one, the next point that uh, Mr. Cubby talks about is synergize. And this is just kind of opening your mind to possibilities. So coming up with what is, how else could we do this? So I promised you we would come up to this chart again, just to give you a, a, big, a closer view. And if you want to take a picture of this, or if you want to watch the recording later and pause it or something, great. Uh, it's, it's, I made it, but it's not exactly proprietary. Uh, so just uh, as a kind of a visual here, you start it with your, with your purchase of the note. The first question you ask is, is it occupied? If it's yes, then you go up to, well, is the borrower willing uh, and able to cooperate? Yes. Are they able to make payments? Yes. Then you can go into some kind of a reinstatement or modification of the loan. Um, after that, you can help them to get refinanced. You can just keep it as a cash flowing loan, or you can season it and resell it as a performing loan at some future date. Uh, so just that's very, very quickly. Uh, that one line and you can go through and follow all the different lines and, and all the different ways that you can exit out of a note um, more so that I would say than traditional real estate and this is one of one of the reasons that I love notes so much is just it's it's a thinking game and uh, it's really fun for me to go through and start thinking of different ways that we can attack the same problem. 
Um, so, and, and a lot of the time it comes with conversation with others. So different vendors and other note investors. I want to give you a couple of examples. So 6803 Backstrom. This is a loan that I bought about a year, year and a half ago. And uh, the ideally, the owner of this note would have to be somebody seasoned, somebody who is local, and somebody who spoke Spanish. So I had the first one. I'm seasoned, but I'm not local, and I don't speak Spanish. So as, as good of a note as it was, and they were paying, they were a little bit spotty, the communication was the biggest hurdle uh, because I don't speak Spanish, and they didn't speak very much English. Uh, there were a few different people in the house, and there was one that spoke Spanish, or sorry, spoke English. Uh, but he was working often and often in different states. And so it was difficult to get a hold of him. So communication was difficult. So I needed, I wanted to resell this loan. It was performing, uh, but there was kind of some special circumstances there where communication was really key uh, in the performance of this loan. So I, I, like I say, I didn't have the tools for that. I don't have a wide enough audience to be able to say, I've got this loan for sale. Who wants it? I, I don't want it to sell to somebody who's not seasoned. I don't want to sell it to somebody that doesn't fit those really those three criteria. What I was able to do is I was able to put it onto a note platform where there are lots of notes for sale. And I had a, a lot of interest in this. Uh, and I wanted to make sure we had the right buyer for both the buyer's sake and the borrower's sake uh, so that this could be a winning note in the long run uh, so we were able to find that it took some time to get the note closed when we were communicating with the guy that didn't live there all the time and all that but uh, but we got the, the job done but it was in collaboration with this other platform a vendor that i use on a regular basis paper stack if you're aware of them and uh, that was how we got that deal done here's another example um 4311 to make a, a long story short uh I had taken back this property, we were selling it. Uh, the title company that was involved in the, in the escrow and everything, at the kind of the last minute, they said, well, there are these other qualifications that we need to have happen before we can, we can certify this. And I, I was going nuts because we, we'd come so far on this already. And it was, uh, it was a bit, a bit more involved in the foreclosure and everything else. And we, we had all that done, uh, but they wanted an additional thing on top of the foreclosure, which in my mind was totally unnecessary. So in my mind, I'm just trying to solve the problem. And I'm going, well, it's unnecessary because of this, this, and this. And the title company just wouldn't budge. And I was just getting frustrated and I'm going, ah, this is crazy. And I go back to my attorney that did the foreclosure and I said, okay, I'm right, right? Uh, we did all this, these extra things that they want done, like it's, they don't need that, right? And they're saying, we're with you. We don't think that that's necessary, but if they're not going to budge, how about a different title company? And my mind was so wrapped up in trying to prove that I was right, that I hadn't, I hadn't taken a step back to say, oh yeah, <laughs> how about a different title company? Uh, which is what we ended up doing. And, uh, and again, it was, it was in a conversation with somebody else that our, our ideas were able to come together and I was able to look outside of, of, I was wrapped up in my own head. So again, getting, getting to the finish line uh, with somebody else's help, some a trusted uh, person. This last one, 1008 Kareem in Mississippi. Uh, this is one where I had taken back the property. The, uh, the house was vacant already. So we took back this property. I was in a smaller town in Mississippi. Um, we put it up on the market and it, it, I think just because of the size of the town, uh, there was just no buyers. So it was on the market for, for a while and I'm having conversations with the, with the realtor saying, so, you know, what do you think? Uh, how, how can we make this move and get this going? And her idea was, well, we got to lower the price, lower the price, lower the price. And I said, well, is it possible or would you be comfortable offering it for seller financing? And she said, oh, well, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, yeah, we can give that a shot. Sure enough, I had somebody come, uh, they're from out of state, they were moving into town and uh, they came in with a 20,000 $20, down payment. Um, and there was something with the interest rate as well where they were actually willing to pay a higher interest rate than what I was asking uh, for a shorter term. And Absolutely. That's a, that's a great idea. <laughs> that works very well. 
So again, this one was from my side where the realtor was saying, let's lower the price. And I said, well, what if we try this instead? And we're able to come up with a, a great uh, solution that uh, otherwise maybe we couldn't come up with uh, individually. I needed her help and she needed my help. So it was a good, a good synergy there. <clears throat> the last habit that uh, Mr. Covey talks about is sharpening the saw. And this is what I would say about this is, is treat this like a real business because it is. This is a real business. You can do this part time. If you're going to do that, even if you're going to do it full time, set work hours. That uh, I, I can't tell you how much that changed my life uh, when I very first started working for myself, where I was, you know, getting up at seven, eight o'clock in the morning and going straight into the office and going forever. Uh, where I would, you know, answer emails or answer phone calls and things like that well into the night. And it wasn't until I kind of took a step back, I went, this is crazy, I'm, I'm tired, and I'm thinking about it all the time, and there's just no break. And so I set regular hours. Uh, I'm in the office from nine to five, generally. Uh, there are exceptions to that, of course. Sometimes it's really nice outside, and I want to go snowboarding. So I'll go snowboarding for an hour in the morning and get in the office at 10. Other times I've got meetings into the evening and I, I go into meetings, uh, you know, at seven or eight o'clock at night. Generally speaking, though, nine to five. That means I do not have notifications on my phone uh, that alert me to uh, an email that came in after hours. Uh, any phone calls that come in, it goes to voicemail and I will get back to them as soon as I possibly can. Uh, but I need my sanity as well. So I, I set those hours and I'm, I'm pretty rigorous in that sense. The other thing is to work on your business instead of just in it. Uh, and this is where it's taking a step back and getting some kind of an outside perspective. Uh, it's so easy to get caught up in the day to day that we, we just we start turning around in circles and it just gets to be too much. So uh, one thing that I would say that is so good for that is conferences. And I've got that I don't know thing in there. This is a conversation my wife and I have had so many times where I said, well, there's this conference coming up. I don't know. I don't know if I want to go. You know, it's tired. This is pre-COVID, of course, but uh, I'm getting tired of going and traveling and all the rest and being away from home. And ah, I don't know. And she said, she reminds me and says, no, every time you go, you come back and you've made some new connection or you've talked to some person, whether it's somebody new or somebody that I'm already working with. And it's going to make a big difference in our business and it just changes everything. And so, so I go to conferences and it, they are so valuable just to get out. And at the very least, it's a break from work so that when you come back to it, yes, it's busy catching up, but you've also got a different perspective and you can, you can add that new perspective to your business and, and come back and treat it like a real business instead of the business running you. The very last thing uh, Mr. Covey talks about in his book is Inside Out. And this is kind of just taking a real hard look at more even so than sharpening the saw, but a real hard look at what it is you're doing and why you're doing it and how you're doing it. And just really picking it apart. Um, and this is so important. And again, this is real estate related, but not real estate. So what does that mean? And how then do you approach this business and how do you how do you then run it with that kind of perspective uh, as you're thinking as a bank, not as a, as a landlord, but taking the time to think it through. My wife did, and I did this several years ago uh, where we actually took three days, uh, exchanged houses with my parents. So they came to watch the kids and we went and stayed at their house. That was one of those times where business hours were not kept, where we would go from eight o'clock till nine o'clock at night and just, we picked apart everything everything, 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 and just said, okay, so this is working, and this is our procedure for this, and if that happens, then we do this, and, and really nailed it down to, to really um, come to a better understanding of what we're doing, and what we're doing well, and what we need to improve on, and so that was very, very helpful. The very last thing I say on this is know your numbers. Again, it's not real estate, so you can't, for example, just put out, you know, a shotgun approach to throwing out offers. Um, that's not going to go over well. Uh, it's a small community and it's a, you know, people know each other. So if you're just throwing out random bids with no real intent to close, uh, that's not going to go over well. So know how much you want to bid and why and make that bid and follow through and see it through. Uh, but that's, 
that's just one example of knowing your numbers. How much, you know, what are some expected expenses during that, uh, during the time you're holding the note? How long are you going to hold it? Um, what happens if they stop performing? All those kinds of things. And just really, really thinking it through and making sure you understand all that goes into it. So that is my presentation. So I, I love notes. I'm, I'm trying to keep this short so it doesn't run over too, too long, but, uh, but I, I could go on all, all day. So I'll, I'll hold it there. We'll see if there's any questions and see, <laughs> see if we can answer anybody's questions. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you so much. That was great. And uh, yeah, we'll open it up for questions. We have the Q&A box there at the bottom. Um, and uh, also, yeah, you, they should have gotten your contact information. You might have some people reaching out to you personally. Great. But uh, yeah, thank you for all the information, Nathan. I, I liked your stories on like specific properties in Texas and Mississippi. It's it's amazing. It's like you're in Canada, but you're doing business in all these different states throughout the, oh, the states. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Of course. Yeah. It's just like something new every day. I mean, like you never get bored, it seems like. No, really. There's uh, every situation is just a little bit different. So it's it's approaching it from a new perspective every time. It's fun. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, the important thing for our uh, listeners right now is that like, these notes, like, like buying these performing or non-performing notes, like it is something that you can do with your IRA funds. It's instead of instead of your personal name that's buying it, it's just going to be your IRA. It would read New View Trust Co. Custodian, FBO, your name, your IRA account number, and all those returns that you get from purchasing that note, all tax free or tax deferred. So it can be uh, really powerful. And uh, when you're doing your note investments, uh, now you know a little bit about the due diligence behind that. So again, Nathan, thank you. And uh, we have Robert Hayes asking if we can put, uh, if Nathan, you can put up your contact information again. If you can share your uh, screen again. Says I cannot share my screen because you are. <laughs> oh, that is true. <laughs> okay. But yeah, no, I whether you're buying in your own IRA or, or using it to invest with somebody else, um, I've done that multiple times where I've taken other people's IRA and put it to work for them. And awesome. it's a great, great vehicle. We have, we have got similar things in Canada, but uh, our version of it, it has to be a publicly traded company. So that eliminates all kinds of possibilities. So I, I Oh, really? In, yeah. in Canada retirement accounts, you can only invest in publicly traded equities? The equivalent to the IRA. Yeah. yeah so the, it's called a tax-free savings account and it's, it's a great vehicle but only if you're going to use it for publicly traded wow. uh, companies. So that's, that narrows it down a lot. <laughs> that's awesome. So Robert, uh, if you're interested in Nathan's contact information, you can just email IRA specialists at New View Trust. And also we do post all of our workshops on our YouTube channel. So you would be able to rewatch this later in the week. Just let us know what works better for you. And uh, also Diane, uh, has a question. Do you have an optimum length of time that you typically keep a note for Nathan? Oh, that, that's really something that comes to preference. Um, for my fund, it's a five-year fund. So I'm keeping them five years uh, at the end of that five years, we're selling them off. Those could go to some of the investors that are in the fund. Um, I'm hoping to pick some up for myself, mm -hmm. uh, and, or just to other investors. So that's, uh, Currently, that's what we're going for, five years. Five years, gotcha. Thanks uh, for the answer there. Any other questions uh, that we have here from the attendees? If not, we'll, uh, we'll wrap things up. And thank you, Diane and Robert, for the questions, by the way. Uh, Jack has a question that says, what is your policy for extension, possibly extension of, of like the term of the note, maybe if he's referring to? Uh, the extension of the note that is maturing, I guess. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. If it's approaching the maturity date, if he's, if it's like, can you extend that possibly if like negotiating that? I don't know, but you kind of just mentioned that you kind of stay within the five year range and, um, I guess we'll, we'll, well, I guess we'll just wrap things up there, but um, you want to reach out. I'd like to understand the question a little bit better, but for sure. 
for sure. Of course, of course. Yeah, no, I think I would too, actually. But uh, okay, so thank you everyone for tuning in today. Um, like I said, questions, email Nathan, email IRA specialist at newviewtrust.com. We're happy to help. And uh, make sure you tune in uh, next week as well. We do these workshops every single Wednesday and uh, we'll have a great workshop next week and uh, we will see you then. Nathan, again, thank you. You bet, thank you.